Raspberry Pis used to be a great option for self-hosting, but sadly, they're just too expensive these days for the average consumer. Now, you could bite the bullet and cough up the money, but maybe there are better options. If you're looking to run a server on some kind of low-powered single board computer, don't skip this video because this guy might look like a Pi knockoff, but it has a few tricks up its sleeve. Now what you can skip out on is the line at the grocery store, thanks to today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Meal planning sucks, which is why my wife and I love using HelloFresh. With a baby and busy schedules, trying to find time to plan out healthy meals and do the grocery shopping can be hard, but HelloFresh takes the stress out of it. Our meals just pop up at our door, ready to be cooked and enjoyed. So even on our busiest nights, we can have a delicious home cooked meal, thanks to some of the quick and easy meals that can be made in about 15 minutes. And you don't have to be an incredible cook to make them. Everything is pre-portioned and the recipes are foolproof. I mean, even I can make them. And it's surprisingly affordable, often either the same price or cheaper than the grocery store. And it's way cheaper than takeout. As the weather warms up, you could spend your time inside Googling recipes or fighting the lines at the grocery store, or you could let HelloFresh do the hard part for you and give you more time to get out and do what you love. So why not give HelloFresh a shot? Right now, you can go to HelloFresh.com and use code HARDWAREHAVEN16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. So what are you waiting for? Save money, save time with HelloFresh. Single board computers like the Raspberry Pi are great for tons of different projects thanks to their various I.O. and expansive ecosystem of accessories and hats, but I'm mostly focusing on using them for self-hosting. Because of their small size and low power draw, they're awesome for running things like Home Assistant, Pi Hole, or really any other service that doesn't need a ton of horsepower. With the continued price hikes of Raspberry Pis though, I wanted to look into alternatives that might not wreak so much havoc on my wallet, or more importantly, your wallet. So when Cotus reached out to me about taking a look at their Vim4, I said, well, that looks cool, but do you have anything more affordable? And eventually they sent me this, the Vim1S. Obviously, this is fairly reminiscent of a Raspberry Pi, but it's quite a bit different for better or for worse. Let's get started with the specs. The Vim 1S is built around the Amlogic S905Y4 SoC, which comes packed with a 2GHz quad-core Cortex A35 ARM CPU, as well as a Mali G31 MP2 GPU that supports decoding for modern codecs like VP9, AV1, and H.265. It has 2GB of LPDDR4 and supports Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth. As you would expect, there's a micro SD card slot on the bottom, but one of the things that sets the Vim 1S apart from other similar boards is the 16 gigabytes of embedded MMC storage, as well as SPI flash storage that contains UWOW, a flashing and management tool that I'll talk more on later. Another nice feature is the addition of power, function, and reset buttons on the side of the PCB, which can be really handy when you're tinkering around with this thing. On the top of the PCB, there is a very obvious 40 pin GPIO, but surprisingly this doesn't use the same pinout as Raspberry Pis, which is a pretty big bummer if you were going to try and use this with any of the vast array of accessories that are in the Pi ecosystem. There are some other fun little connections like the VIN 5 volt power input if you're into Arduino and more maker stuff, but that doesn't really help a ton in the context that I'm working in, but they are cool features and might be of interest or value to you. On the front, you get a USB-C port for power, as well as a full-size HDMI port. But that's kind of where the good news ends in regards to the front I.O. Because all that's left are these two USB 2.0 ports and a 100 megabit Ethernet port. This is the part where I wanted to just cry a little bit because in a lot of ways, this thing is great, but that missing 900 megabits of bandwidth really puts some limits on what this thing is capable of. But all hope isn't lost. While this might not be great for things like file sharing, it could still be a solid option for a lot of lighter weight services like Home Assistant or Pi-hole, or to use for monitoring all of your other servers and services. Heck, if you're on a 100 megabit per second or lower internet connection, this thing could even run just fine as a VPN server. Now, I don't have a ton of things to compare this to, just my Pi-4 and Pi-0. And before checking current prices, my plan was to sort of position this against the Pi 4. But after checking current prices, the Pi Zero is actually the more direct competitor. 
because while it comes in at a lower cost of only $50 or so, at least at the time of filming, you would need to factor in the price of an SD card for storage, as well as a USB to Ethernet adapter. Remember, the Vim 1S has built-in eMMC storage, so you don't necessarily need to buy an SD card to run the operating system. Now, the Pi Zero definitely has an advantage thanks to its incredibly small size and the massive ecosystem of accessories and such, but for just running some server tasks, well, how well do these two stack up? Well, first, I decided to do a few benchmarks with the Vim 1S as well as the Pis. I started off with the CPU benchmark of Sysbench, and with a single thread, the Pi 4 managed 1,780 events per second, with the Vim 1S well behind at just 897. But the Pi Zero, with its single core 1 GHz Broadcom CPU, only managed 32 events per second. When we bump the test up to four threads, the Pi 4 and Vim 1S scale fairly well at 7,134 and 3,584 events per second respectively, but the Pi Zero still came in at 32 events per second, which makes sense being a single core CPU. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, yeah, this makes sense because the Pi Zero is in a completely different product class. It consumes way less power, so that makes sense. Well, no. The Pi Zero consumed 1.6 watts at idle and 2 watts while running a sustained load. The Vim 1S, on the other hand, only consumed 1.5 watts at idle and jumped up to 2.2 watts under a sustained load. But you have to keep in mind how much more powerful this CPU is, meaning when given the same tasks, the Vim 1S is going to be sitting at idle a lot more often. The Pi 4 consumed quite a bit more here, but also performed substantially better, so it's pretty fair. I ran Apache Bench from one of my other servers to test how well these could handle network requests, starting with just a generic Nginx Hello World Docker container, and the Pi Zero falls way behind again, with only 145 requests per minute, compared to the Vim 1S at over 2600. To give a bit more of a real world example though, I decided to install Home Assistant on each of these using the Linux server.io image, and then tested the response of the welcome page. And here, well, the Pi Zero actually couldn't even run it. And this shows a big weakness of the Pi Zero, which is its older V6 version of the ARM architecture. It's not uncommon to come across software that just isn't compatible with it, such as this example here. The Vim 1S, however, has no issues there and managed 288 requests per minute, with the Pi 4 at 567. In comparison to its most closely priced Raspberry Pi alternative, the Vim 1S looks pretty good so far on paper, but benchmarks only tell part of the story. So rather than more of those, I wanted to put it to use in the real world. And this is where I get to talk about probably my favorite thing about the Vim 1S, which is OOWL. First of all, super fun to say. Ooh, wow. It's fun, right? Ooh, wow. Also, it's stupid. Also, it's really fun to use. When you first boot up the Vim 1S, you'll land on the Ooh, wow install wizard, which lets you download a variety of pre-made images, such as Android or Ubuntu, download them into RAM, and then install them onto the embedded storage. And maybe it was just because I was trying out a lot of different images at the time and also trying to flash the cards for the Raspberry Pis, but Uwau just felt really fast and helpful. And it could do quite a bit, like install custom images from a flash drive, dump the current image to a flash drive, which is super useful, update or repair the device firmware, and more, including some games, which I'm really bad at Tetris, by the way. I landed on the latest available release of Ubuntu Server and downloaded and installed it with no issues. I got Docker up and running and, as mentioned earlier, ran Home Assistant. I got a bit irritated trying to remember how to get Samba up and running properly as it's been a while since I've done that on Ubuntu and then realized it was probably easier and more worth it to just see if Casa OS would run on this as I had just done a whole tutorial on it. I had a feeling I was at least going to run into something goofy with this being ARM based and a little bit of a niche product, but no. Casa OS installed just fine and it honestly seems like a great fit for something like this. You can run a lot of simple services like AdGuard Home or Pihole, and actually one of the cool things that stood out to me as a potential use case was Unify Controller. Now I don't actually have any Unify stuff, so that in particular wouldn't make sense for me, 
But I actually might use this to run something called Omada Controller, which is sort of TP-Link's version of Unify Controller, which would make a lot more sense since I actually own TP-Link switches and access points that could be managed by that. I also ran Uptime Kuma, as I think this could be great for monitoring some of your other servers or services in your home lab. I could have done a lot of little things, but I sort of wanted to see if I could break this thing. So I threw the Minecraft paper server that I've used in the past at it, and well, yeah, it wasn't a great experience. After a long time though, the world did finally load in, but I wouldn't really recommend it unless you're into some very interesting world designs. That being said, once the terrain was finally generated, it worked decently well. So I imagine if someone really wanted to mess around with pre-generating worlds and such, you could get this working for a small Minecraft server. Although I don't know how well that will really work out in the long run, who knows. Now earlier, I did mention using this as a VPN. I was nervous that Tailscale might have some issues installing, but once again, it went pretty smoothly. I set this up as an exit node in the exact same way I did in my Casa OS tutorial, which you can check that out if you're interested. And within just a minute or two, I had a working Tailscale exit node. Now, obviously I was limited a bit in terms of bandwidth, but 70 to 80 megabits per second isn't terrible if you're just using it for a few things, especially if you don't have a very fast internet connection anyway. Speaking of internet connections, I did test out using a USB to ethernet adapter because while it's a lot slower than USB 3, USB 2 should still be at least three times or so faster than the 100 megabit per second port. And that turned out to be the case when testing some file transfers. So you could sacrifice a bit of stability for slightly better networking speeds if you want. I also did a quick read speed benchmark on the eMMC and SD card storage using HDParm to see how much better the internal storage was compared to an SD card. And at least when reading from storage, the eMMC is quite a bit faster than my SanDisk something. It's a decent SD card. I can't remember the exact specs. I should know. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not really into Kodi and Corelec and such, but I did spin up the image of Android TV that was available in UWOW, as I saw it was fairly recent. At first, things seemed to be buttery smooth, as the menus looked good and YouTube playback was great, but it seems like there might be a few bugs that need to be worked out. First of all, I couldn't get casting to work, which is a huge bummer, because I was sort of hoping I could maybe use this to replace one of our old Chromecasts, but that might not be the case for now or ever. I actually bought a remote that Kata sells for only like five bucks. And well, yeah, that price sounds about right because it worked some of the time, sort of. Yeah, I don't really know. There was just a lot of times where button presses didn't seem to register at all. And I, I can't quite tell if it's an IR issue or a remote issue or a software issue, but eh. Also, while some video playback was clearly taking advantage of the Mali GPU, other apps were not, at least not correctly. This slideshow here is supposed to be the HBO TV static intro at a nice cinematic two seconds per frame or so. I really hope some of these issues get worked out somehow, and I'm not even entirely sure where the fault lies and who might be able to fix them, but I hope it happens because this could be a cool little media player. I have seemed to hear good things generally from other YouTubers that have covered this from more of a media player or emulator approach, so maybe go check those videos out if that type of stuff interests you. But for using it as a server, the Vim 1S seems like a good deal when comparing it to its Raspberry Pi cousins, but what about all the other single board computers out there? Well, I'm not really familiar with everything that's available these days, but I did do a little bit of looking around for a better deal and ended up coming across this, the Libra computer, a, uh, I don't know, the, the lay potato is what it seems to go by. Specs wise, it's not quite as powerful as the Vim 1S and also doesn't have USB 3 or gigabit ethernet, but comes in at just over half the price. So if all you're wanting is bare minimum computing at a low cost and low power draw, is this the better deal? Well, I wanted to know, so I bought one, clearly. And I did all of the same tests that I did with the other boards. And well, the Vim 1S sort of held up here. The Lay Potato had respectable results in Sysbench as well as Apache Bench, but definitely was a performance tier below the Vim 1S. And while a few tenths of a watt isn't much, the Vim 1S did manage to outperform while also consuming slightly less power. So that is a bit of a win there. 
Realistically though, the difference in efficiency is negligible, and things like UWOW, EMMC storage, and even the built-in power buttons would factor into my decision more than a fraction of a watt. So the Vim 1S is a solid performer with really good efficiency and some nice features. The embedded storage and UWOW are honestly super helpful and easy to use, keeping you from having to pop SD cards in and out all of the time while you're trying different things out. Plus the support for decoding modern video codecs like AV1, plus the full-size HDMI port, could be great if you ever end up using it in the future as a media player. However, the lack of gigabit ethernet and faster USB is a big bummer and really limits some of the awesome things you could do with something like this. Also, why not use the Raspberry Pi GPIO? I, it doesn't make sense to me. It's, I don't know. If you're just looking for something really inexpensive to run some simple services on and you don't care about having some of the nicer features that the Vim 1S offers, maybe look into something like the Libra Computer Lay Potato. Huge thanks to Kottis for sending this board over, and if you're interested in any of the boards that I talked about, including this one, obviously, I'll have links in the description where you can go find them and support the Hardware Haven channel. And if you like this video, make sure and give it a like as that really goes a long way, and maybe consider subscribing if you want to see more videos like this. Also, don't forget to go to HelloFresh.com and use code HARDWAREHAVEN16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.